Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Gina. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be sharing with you this story. It's an interesting story. Um, and uh, often when I do these talks, people have uh, personal connections to the uh, the Quadi project and to Eastport or some of the people uh, that I'll mention in the story. So if you do, by all means, uh, share them with the group or with me uh, privately. Uh, I'm always interested and definitely uh, I love questions. So uh, ask away. Uh, and let's get uh, my screen up here. Um, so. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Quality Title Power Project um, and Frank and Roosevelt's role in it. Uh, and it's a really fascinating project for a lot of different reasons. Uh, first of all, that it was a pioneering project. Um, it was going to be the first commercial scale tidal electric power plant in the world. It was also going to be the world's largest power plant. And those two things, the first and the largest, made it controversial from the moment it was announced. Um, and the, there was lots of different types of controversy. One was, could it be done? Also, was it needed at all? That was an enormous power plant to put in Maine. And this will seem strange to you, but I wanted to alert you now because uh, when your ear is tuned to this, you will start to understand uh, the story. <laughs> uh, was it capitalism or was it communism? Um, and uh, this project uh, took me about three years to do. It was a really interesting project to do during COVID because I had a whole lot of documents to go through tens of thousands of pages of documents. Um, and it was really interesting as I was reading all these newspaper articles, um, it was just like the newspaper I was reading of today's events uh, because the project, the issues that Quadi raised are still relevant today. There's all kinds of stuff about dirty politics and fake news, um, the, the supply of electricity, the reliability of the grid, the price people pay for the electricity because uh, there's about a 10 to 1 differential in the price that people pay for electricity, depending on where you are in the country. And who benefits from that high price or that low price has a lot to do with politics. And ultimately, all of this really comes down to an issue of control of natural resources. Um, and sometimes these uh, struggles for control uh, manifest themselves as native uh, claims. Big issue here in the United States. It's a huge issue in Canada. Um, it also manifests itself in terms of monopolies. Uh, there are uh, many generations of monopolies. There were the uh, uh, trading companies uh, that the European nations set up. There were the robber barons of the train era, power companies, and we, of course, now have a whole new set of monopolies. And sometimes these uh, power struggles for power and control over natural resources turn into real wars. And one of the surprising things about this story about the Kauai Tidal Power Project is that it directly relates to today's events in Ukraine. Um, and as you will see, uh, it's a surprising connection. So um, on we go. Um, the, uh, as many of you will know, uh, Passamaquoddy Bay is part of the Bay of Funday, which is part of the Gulf of Maine. And the Bay of Fundy is world famous as having the world's highest tides. Um, and there's a whole subject we can talk about for many, many hours. Uh, but the key two elements that give Passamaquoddy Bay and the Bay of Fundy the highest tides in the world are number one, the funnel effect. Gulf of Maine is a big wide open bay. The tide comes in twice a day and it gets just into an ever narrower and shallower area. And so the, all that water has to go somewhere, so it goes up. And the second thing is the tides slosh back and forth. And so uh, the tide, as it sloshes out, gets met by another incoming tide and it just the right sequence. So the whole bay sloshes back and forth. And that's called the bathtub effect because it's just like sitting in a bathtub and with a little bit of rhythmic uh, waving of your hand, you can set up waves that splash right out of the tub. And that's what goes on uh, in the Bay of Fundy. And that's important, of course, because if you want a lot of power, you need a lot of tides. So 
Uh, Passamaquoddy Bay uh, is a really interesting bay. It's big. It's 150 square miles of territory. That is a lot of territory. And it's also a very complicated bay. Um, as you can see from the map here, it's, uh, it's, it's got lots of islands and lots of coves. And that's because a series of fault, geological fault, fault lines meet. And that's what creates this, this complex geography. Um, and it's also important because that's mostly hard rock. Um, and as you'll see, that's important to the story. So our story really focuses on two islands, uh, Eastport, Maine, which is on Moose Island, uh, and Campobello Island, which is in New Brunswick. And as you can see from the map, uh, the international border between the United States and Canada goes right between the two of them. And all of these things are important to the way the story came about. And so as you can see here, Aquati, which is the nickname that was given to the Possumaquati Bay Tidal Power Project, is just an abbreviation of Possumaquati. So uh, that's where we are. And the, the town of Eastport, little city really, uh, was known as the sardine uh, city or the sardine capital of the world. Uh, and they did an enormous amount of fishing for herring, sardines. And this industry is an extractive industry. And it really peaked in about 1900. And our story really gets going in about 1920. So for two decades, Eastport has been experiencing economic decline. And so they're looking for some way to reverse that decline. Um, and it's it's a blue collar city. Right across uh, the bay, across the channel, really, is Campobello Island, which is in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, it's only 750 feet from Lubeck, Maine, you can see up here, uh, across Lubeck Narrows to Campobello. Uh, and Campobello developed quite differently. Um, it became a resort community for the wealthy. Um, and you can see here one of the four uh, resort hotels that were built there. And there were also a series of private cottages that were built, um, uh, large cottages. And one of them was for the Roosevelts. In fact, it was for Franklin Roosevelt's parents who brought him uh, to Campobello when he was one year old. Um, and he, he, their parents loved it. They decided to buy a house um, and then they started expanding it. And so from the age one, Franklin Roosevelt grew up uh, spending his summers at Campobello. And he, he loved it because it gave him freedom. Um, and he got to sail. Uh, and here he is at age six, sailing his father's 60 foot yacht, which you see down below. Um, and he was tutored by his father, excuse me, by his father. Uh, but also by the fishing captains and by the local Indian chiefs. So whether it was a, a, a fishing boat, a sailboat, or canoe, Franklin became an expert in navigating uh, the high tides, fast currents, and difficult rocky waters of the Bay of Fundy in all kinds of boats. Um, and that uh, became very important to our story, as you'll see. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to point out here, as you can see, is that uh, Franklin was born really just after, a couple of years after Thomas Edison invites, invents the uh, practical electric light bulb. And so if you think about that as the, the dawn of the electric age, Franklin was born into the electric age. He was what we would call now a digital navy. He, uh, for kids who were born with cell phones in their hands, uh, Franklin was born with uh, electricity. Every day, people were finding new ways to generate it, new ways to use it, and the, it was exploding. And he was part of that, especially being a, born into affluence. He experienced it early. He mastered it early. And those two things led that baby face, a uh, little sailor, to become this baby face sailor, Franklin Roosevelt, the youngest assistant secretary of the United States Navy. Now, he got that certainly because he had a couple of important connections, including his uncle, who was former president. But he also really knew what he was doing. Um, and uh, he, he loved the job uh, because it gave him access to 
uh, all the coolest, newest stuff, including this little thing. This is the USS Flusser. It's the fastest ship in the Navy. And Franklin Roosevelt took it through Lubeck Narrows. Um, and as you saw on a previous slide, Lubeck Narrows is a narrow, twisty, shallow, rocky channel. And he went through that thing, not at six knots, like his father's sailboat, but at about 27 knots. So he had a ball um, and he had access to really impressive technology. Now in his role, official role, not just playing around with fast boats, but in his official role, he was part of the team that was responsible for new technologies in the U.S. Navy. And new technology in the U.S. Navy focused on electricity. So he saw all the coolest, newest uh, uh, technologies, including things like radio and how to generate electricity, how to transmit signals. Um, and so he knew more about electricity than almost anybody because he was seeing it being developed. So um, that's Franklin. Um, he's part of the electric age. And as I said, people were finding all kinds of new things that they could use electricity for and how much it helped uh, in all kinds of ways. And so there was a mad, rat, uh, mad race all across the world, but particularly in the United States, to find places to, to generate power. And one of the best ways to generate electric power is from falling water. So if you want to generate a lot of electric power, a really good way to do that is to find a really big waterfall. And of course, in the United States, the biggest is Niagara. And so uh, people have been using Niagara Falls for generating power at small levels for a long time. Uh, but in 1903, uh, there had already there was already a couple of small electric power plants, but they decided to build one which is going to be ten times bigger than what was already built. Um, and to do that, they had to do a lot of complicated engineering things. Uh, one of the things was that you Niagara Falls was so big you couldn't capture it all, and so you had to take a piece of it. And so one of the things they had to do, as you can see in this diagram or this photograph, is they had to build. Uh, a wing dam to divert part of the flow of the river into the powerhouse. And then it dropped down a uh, hundred feet or so to the turbines through a great big tunnel. And then believe it or not, the two people who were building this, the Cooper brothers, Hugh, the older brother and Dexter, the younger brother, then dug a, a tunnel under Horseshoe Falls to get rid of all that water. So the water came in here, drops down 90 feet through uh, the turbines and then exits underneath Horseshoe Falls. And they had to dig underneath Horseshoe Falls. Uh, some of the most famous people in the world said it couldn't be done, including uh, Lord Kelvin. Um, and, uh, but they did it. Um, and so this became the world's largest hydroelectric power plant. And I believe this person right here is Dexter Cooper, who uh, we'll see. And I believe that he, uh, and this is at the end of the, of the wing dam. So he's standing right there. And if he falls in, or if any of them fall into the river, right about here is where uh, Horseshoe Falls is. So if you fall into the river, you fall over Niagara Falls. So very dangerous work, uh, no fatalities whatsoever, a huge success. Um, and so when they're done, I want you to remember this, when the Cooper brothers have finished building the world's largest dam, they don't go to, uh, to Disneyland, they go and build a bigger dam. And in fact, the next dam they, they tackle is across the Mississippi River. Uh, and this is built at Keokuk, Iowa. Um, and uh, again, uh, pioneering dam, all kinds of interesting technology goes into it, uh, including they, they build this one out of uh, uh, one continuous, huge, long piece of concrete. It's called a monolith. It's one unseamed piece of concrete. They learned, they figured out how to pour concrete continuously 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
365 days a year so that there's no seams, the whole thing goes across. Again, hugely successful. Um, and in the process of building this dam, Dexter Cooper, the younger brother, who is the construction manager, and I think that's him right here, who's about to walk across here to, to uh, uh, ceremonially shake hands with the uh, other side. He meets a lovely young lady named Gertrude Sturgis, who's out visiting her brother who works on the railroad. They fall in love. They decide to get married, uh, which they do in Boston. Uh, and uh, then on their honeymoon, where are you supposed to go? Uh, they do go to Niagara Falls, but on their way, they go to Campobello, Campobello, New Brunswick, because her parents have a house on Campobello, and it is right next door to Franklin Roosevelt's house. So she grows up as Franklin Roosevelt's next door neighbor. So if you're the Cooper brothers and you've just built the world's biggest dam twice, what do you do next? You build a bigger one. Now, in this case, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers actually started building this one. And this is on the Wilson Dam, otherwise known as the Muscle Shoals Dam, uh, on the Tennessee River. Um, and uh, the Army was building it uh, because uh, if you need to generate, if you need ammunition, you need to, to create nitrates. And if you need nitrates, you need to, the best way to do it is to use electricity. And so the army was building a huge power dam in order to create nitrates to create explosives. Um, and uh, this was begun during World War I when Franklin Roosevelt was uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Um, and the thing is that they didn't finish it um, because they started having trouble. And so the Army Corps of Engineers um, called in the Cooper brothers to fix it. And the Cooper brothers, Hugh, uh, the older, mostly the engineer, designer, and Dexter, the younger, the construction manager, came in, changed the design, re uh, and then finished the construction. Uh, but it didn't get fit done until after the war was over. And so what are you going to do with this huge $100 million project? Uh, because at now, you don't need all those explosives, so you don't need all that power. So what are you going to do with it? Well, um, you can use nitrates also for fertilizer. And so some people thought it should be used as fertilizer plant. But in Alabama, there was an electric utility company that had a monopoly. And the monopoly folks said, it's our territory. We have monopoly. Therefore, you should give us the power plant or destroy it. Now, as you can imagine, that didn't go over well with a lot of people. Um, and so uh, basically a stalemate ensued and this thing sat empty, unused for years. Um, but there are people who were trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, in the meantime, if you're the Cooper brothers and you've just built three of the world's uh, three, the world's lar three largest power plants, what are you going to do next? You're going to build an even bigger one. And in this case, Dexter decided to tackle the sea itself and specifically the Bay of Fundy. The issue is, how do you hold an ocean? How do you grab hold of a whole ocean? in order to generate power. Um, and to give you a sense of how much moving water there is in the, in the Bay of Fundy, we can see these graphics. In a single day, the Bay of Fundy moves more four times more water than all of the rivers of the world combined. So it's an enormous amount of water that's moving in and out of the Bay of Fundy every day. Uh, it really is mind-boggling to stand at the top of the Bay of Fundy and, and watch 50 feet of water move up and down twice a day. Um, and all that movement of water generates an enormous amount of power. 
that power, if you could harness it, is theoretically equal to 250 nuclear power plants. And that's four times as many power plants that is currently operating in the United States. So it's an enormous amount of power. The trick is figuring out how to harness it. So uh, let's take a minute and talk about rivers versus uh, tides for generating electricity. There are certain advantages and disadvantages uh, uh, for tides. Uh, the advantage is that tides are totally predictable. It's all about astronomy. Astronomy is all about math. If you do enough math, you can predict the tides for any place on Earth, any date in the future. Um, and that kind of predictability is fabulous for business models. So it's, it's really terrific. Um, and uh, just an example of that, the ocean, your source of power, has never gone dry. There's never a drought. You will always be able to generate power if you set up to do so. The disadvantage of uh, tides compared to rivers for uh, generating power is that the tides are intermittent. They go up, they go down, and that when they go up, the water comes in, and they go down this way. Uh, and so uh, typically, the way you would uh, use tides for power production is you'd have the tide come in and fill a basin and then dam it off. Uh, and you've got a high tide now within the basin and you'd force the water through a turbine and it would spin. Uh, but once your basin is empty at low tide, you don't have any power. So it's intermittent. And the second thing is that the tides, as you may know, uh, are an hour later every day or 50 minutes later every day. Um, so it's very inconvenient. So intermittent uh, is bad for business models and uh, later is bad for business models because people's schedules are, you know, work day, sleep, work day, sleep. Um, and so you really need predictability to be able to sell power. So those are the, that's what Dexter had to figure out how to overcome. Now, the common thing about uh, using rivers and uh, tides uh, for generating power is that they use similar technologies. Basically, they, you build a big dam, which is very expensive, um, and you have big turbines in it. Uh, but once you build it, your fuel water is free. Um, as compared to you get a, a gas or diesel powered generator, it doesn't cost a lot up front, but they break down lot faster um, and then you have to pay for fuel forever after. And fuel, as you know, tends to go up in price. Um, so uh, that's that's what you gotta balance all of these things. So uh, Dexter's been thinking about this. Um, he's been thinking about this since his honeymoon uh, when he got this original idea and he's been noodling away trying to think about how to do it. And in 1924, he announces what comes to be known as the International Plan for the Quadi Tidal Power Project. And it's uh, it's going to be the world's largest power plant. Um, it's going to be two countries because it's going to span possible Quadi Bay. So not only is it the United States, but it's Canada before it. You've got two Canada countries. It's it's 150 square miles. It's the, he proposes to, to uh, uh, enclose the entire bay through a series of dams that hopscotch from Lubeck Point to Campobello, from Campobello to Deer Island, from Deer Island and to Latite. And therefore, he's got the whole bay. But rather than building one gigantic uh, power pond or mill pond, he proposes to, to use a strategy that was really developed in Boston about 100 years earlier to use two pools, a high pool and a low pool. And basically what he does is when the tide comes in, he constantly tops up the big pool and uh, and it's uh, and then he places his turbines between the big pool, the high pool and the low pool. Uh, and at low tide, he always lets all the water out of the low pool. So essentially he can always maintain at least eight, if not 26 foot differential in the level of the tides. Uh, and therefore he can generate 
power continuously. In fact, about 3 billion kilowatts of power, just an enormous amount of power. Um, and obviously all of this is gonna be the world's biggest thing. It's also gonna have the world's biggest turbines, the largest flow, which is gonna be bigger than the St. Lawrence River. It's huge project. Um, and this is gonna be a for-profit enterprise with Dexter being the designer, the builder, and the CEO. So this is the definition of aggressive capitalism. So that's what he proposes in uh, 1924. Uh, but he's not the only person who wants to generate and sell electric power in Maine. There's also this company, Central Maine Power. Central Maine Power starts off as a small little uh, monopoly, but they're, they're very successful, they're profitable, and so they start buying up their neighboring companies. Um, so they get to be regional. Um, and then they uh, also start buying up uh, companies that use their power so they can guarantee themselves that market for their services. Um, and since they understand this uh, monopoly utility model pretty well, they start buying up other utilities, such as drinking water companies, trolley and transportation companies. And then since they're having so much profit from all of these monopoly control that they're developing, they start buying the banks as well, and then the newspapers. So in combination, they create an enormous economic and political power. Um, and uh, the people who do it are interesting batch of people. Uh, on the left here is Carol Perkins. I don't actually know a lot about him, but uh, stomping, chewing on a cigar here is Walter Wyman. He's got a damn name back for him. Um, he is as hard bitten a character as he looks. Um, and then this guy uh, is Martin Insel. He is from Chicago and he's on the board uh, because the way that they got all these companies over here was through leverage and they couldn't grow fast enough. So they sold part of themselves to uh, the Chicago folks in order to get access to Chicago's capital and thereby generate, leverage that capital and buy even more stuff. And so at about the time that this photograph was taken, uh, the insoles are on a buying spree, which would eventually uh, net them about 2,700 companies. They had ownership control of 2,700 companies. Now, the fourth person here is another interesting one. He's William Skelton. He is the former chairman of the Maine Department of Public Utility Control. And if that sounds like a conflict of interest, you'd be right. But Central Maine Power is not the only people doing these kind of things, this, this huge conglomerations of power and money and control. Uh, in fact, it's happening all over the country. Um, and some of the people who are watching, the regulators in, the, in Washington, uh, policymakers in Washington are getting worried because even though the demand for electricity is growing fast, the market, the industry is growing much faster. And so how, how can the industry be growing at one speed and the, uh, the, the demand be growing at this speed, but the, the, the finances of the industry be growing at so much faster. And so they, they're worried. And so the Senate eventually launches an investigation um, into the practices, the financial practices of the electric utility industry. And they put Hugo Black, a senator from Alabama, right near Muscle Shoals, uh, in charge, and he's a brilliant uh, uh, attorney, um, and he calls, he subpoenas this gentleman, Howard Hobson, who's president of one of these huge conglomerates based in the Mid-Atlantic area. And pretty quickly, uh, Hugo Black figures out that, uh, and documents that this gentleman, Howard Hobson, has, has been doing a massive propaganda campaign, all funded by your or the, the rate payers, the consumers, because it's qualified 
had operating expense and the monopolies guaranteed a profit on operating costs. Therefore, consumers paid for the propaganda and the company made a profit off of the propaganda. And all of that was driving uh, massive amounts of financial fraud. Um, and eventually they dug through uh, all of that. They produced a, a 9,000 page report. Um, and surprisingly, this gentleman went to jail. But the, uh, as I told you previously, uh, a large amount of the press at this time was owned or controlled by the power companies. And so this whole story was quashed um, and no real changes were made. And so the problems kept going and getting bigger. So now that is the environment that Dexter Cooper is trying to work within or around. And so he has been working on his project, the Quiet Tower Power Project, for um, almost 10 years now. Um, and as you can imagine, a project this big would be very complicated and include all kinds of difficulties, especially because it's involving two countries. Um, and uh, so Dexter had worked his way through all of that. He'd gotten the engineering okays. He'd got preliminary finance. No one knew where, but he had it. Uh, he had gotten all his uh, permits um, and he'd gotten the go ahead contingent on a fisheries report. Now it's not an environmental impact study. It was really about the impact on the fisheries industry. Um, and this was gonna take three years longer than his preliminary permits. So he had to go get on a train, go back out to Ottawa um, to, to get the Canadians to extend his permits because that's, they wanted to, to do that. And he said, fine. Um, so he goes out to Ottawa um, and they have this meeting, uh, which should be a totally bureaucratic process. And suddenly it stopped. Instead of just granting the, the required time that they required to do this extra study, they didn't renew his permits at all. And so that killed Kauai and killed is the word that was used in the press at the time because the meeting was not about that. It was about just extend a bureaucratic extension, but it suddenly they called a vote and the vote was to not renew the permits and it went by party line. And so something was up. So the question was, who killed Kauai? why and how. Now, uh, the first suspicion uh, fell on the Canadian fishing industries, but that really didn't make sense because Dexter had actually, as part of his, his permitting process, he had guaranteed to cover any losses of the Canadian fishing industry and the American too. The American fishing industry was 10 times as large. Um, so it didn't really make sense that the Canadian fishing industry would try to kill it if they're Interests were already covered. So then the question was, well, what's this going on? This, this party line vote that came out of nowhere. So something is up. And the suspicion then shifts to, maybe it's the American power companies that found a convenient way to kill a future competitor. So what are you gonna do? You can blame everyone you want. You can work to figure out what happened. But Dexter, who's spent 10 years of his life now, has said, I'm going to give my whole life to this if it takes it. And he starts work again in April 1929. But what else happens in 1929? All, all those bad deeds catch up with the industry. And in 1929, in October, the stock market collapses and the Great Depression starts. And the stock market crashes largely because there's a huge amount of financial speculation and fraud in the industry, uh, in, in a lot of different industries, but most especially in the electric utility industry. And uh, so the whole pyramid scheme comes crashing down. 
And in fact, the Insel brothers, remember uh, Martin Insel from Chicago, they go bankrupt. It's the largest bankruptcy in American history. And all of this means that uh, there's no money available for anybody to do anything, most especially anything this big or this new or this complicated. And so there's no money for quality. So quality goes quiescent. Um, and so uh, quality is quiet. But the depression is rampant. And so something has to be done. And at this point, uh, people are not satisfied with Herbert Hoover and that administration. And Franklin Roosevelt, comes up, who is now governor of New York, says, I think I know how to solve this problem. And so he runs for president. Uh, and he proposes a new deal for the American people. And basically he's saying that he believes that the government itself needs to actively participate in the economy in order to fix the economy. And that he conceives of three key components, relief, recovery, and reform. Relief is emergency food and housing for the people who need it. It's the dole. People are starving. They're freezing to death. House them and feed them. Recovery is economic stimulus. It's deficit spending um, to make work. So these are big infrastructure projects. This is the, the infrastructure for future prosperity. Um, and then the third thing, so that gets people producing something productive. And the third thing is to fix what's broken. That's the reform. And this is really about the, the financial industry and also about the um, electric industry. Um, and when you roll all those things together, relief, recovery, and reform, they manifest themselves most spectacularly in Roosevelt's public power initiatives, which you know today is the great Western dams. So that concept, the New Deal, relief, recovery, and reform, direct action on the part of the government to support its people, is uh, seen by the American people as the right way to do to attack the depression. They vote uh, Franklin Roosevelt in a major uh, uh, upset. Um, and Franklin Roosevelt does not wait to become president to begin work on this project. He starts work immediately. And in fact, in January, before he's president, he's now just president-elect, he goes to Muscle Shoals, Alabama, at the invitation of George Norris, the Republican senator from Nebraska. So you might ask, what is a Republican senator from Nebraska doing inviting the Democratic president to Alabama? And the answer is that George Norris is a radical. He is a free-thinking, independent Republican. And he has an idea that instead of having the Muster Shoals Dam, that $100 million project, sit there idle or be given to the local private power monopoly, he thinks instead it should be used as a government-sponsored regional economic development based on hydropower, which is to say, invert the whole thing. It says, basically, if you coordinate your uh, activities, you can view this power plant as a way to improve the, the lives of everybody in the region. Um, and so that's the genesis of what becomes the Tennessee Valley Authority, what becomes the power projects of the Roosevelt administration. Franklin loves this idea. Um, and so he immediately wants to start work. So if you're Franklin Roosevelt and you're interested in knowing more about uh, Muscle Shoals Dam and how to, to, to build on this idea, who are you gonna call? You're gonna call the Cooper brothers because Dexter is your next door neighbor. And so uh, what do you think the Cooper brothers are doing right now? They are, of course, building a bigger dam. But it's not in the United States because the United States is in depression. It's somewhere where the economy is booming. It is in Soviet Russia. 
in fact, it is in the Ukraine. It is on the Dnieper River. And this is a picture that appeared in Life magazine in 1931 by Margaret Bourke White, both of these photographs. Um, and it's of the Dnieper Dam being constructed. It is, when they're building it, the largest dam in the world. It is to this day still the largest dam in Europe. And that's Hugh Copert, the older brother. Um, um, and uh, uh, so this is a really interesting project for the couple of catalysts to be uh, working on uh, a dam in the Soviet Union. So you might ask, um, whoops, you might ask who, if you're building a dam in the Soviet Union, who are you building it for? And the answer is Joseph Stalin. Hugh Cooper, uh, who's on the left here, is having lunch with Joseph Stalin in the middle. And Hugh Cooper, who only has a high school diploma, is the world's famous, most successful hydroelectric engineer. And he debates economic policy with Joseph Stalin. He actually convinces Joseph Stalin to put financial incentives into the system, at least with some, not a lot, but some, because without them, he says, your system will fail. And so Stalin does, in fact, uh, modify the Soviet plan to put in financial incentives. And Hugh Cooper is in this position to have lunch with Joseph Stalin debate economic policy because the Dnieper Dam is the single largest piece of infrastructure in the Soviet Union. Um, and it is the centerpiece of what becomes known as Golero or the first five-year plan, the first uh, government-sponsored regional economic development plan based on hydropower, goal-oriented. And uh, and it's so key to the entire project, to the, the Soviet Union, that uh, Joseph Stalin awards Hugh Cooper the what is the equivalent of the our American medal, uh, Presidential Medal of Honor. So the highest civilian medal you can get is awarded to Joseph Stalin awards to Hugh Cooper. Um, and in fact, if you look at the metal itself, the background of the metal is the Dnieper Dam. Um, and all of this is designed to take the Soviet Union, which it was, uh, was at this time basically a peasant agrarian economy, and it's designed to put in place or transition it to a uh, modern industrial economy. So basically, this is to go at double speed into the, the modern world. Um, and uh, they're very successful. At that. So, um, so where do you think that radical Republican got the idea for a government-sponsored regional economic development? Right. So uh, Franklin Roosevelt does become, in fact, become president. And just five weeks later, he has a meeting in the White House with Senator Norris and Secretary of State Cordell Hall and Hugh Cooper. And the agenda is really rather remarkable. It is the, not, item number one is diplomatic recognition of the Soviet Union because uh, the Soviet Union has not yet been recognized. It's been 17 years since the uh, Russian Revolution, but most of the world doesn't recognize them as a country. And Hugh Cooper is arguing in favor of recognition because he says, I and General Electric the company who produced all the equipment for the Dnieper Dam are a perfect example of uh, a market for American jobs over in Russia. And the second thing uh, that they talk about is Muscle Shoals and CVA, which of course Hugh knows all about. And the third thing is that Hugh proposes to Franklin his little brother's project, the Quadi Title Project, to be taken over by the government as one of those government-sponsored regional economic development projects based on hydropower. So at this meeting, the concept for quality, quality title power project, switches from capitalism to communism in the eyes of some. 
That meeting had a lot of consequences. The first of which was that the Soviet Union was in fact uh, recognized diplomatically by the United States, which set off a whole cascade of other countries that countries that did as well. Um, and uh, uh, they had a big celebratory party at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. And there's Dexter Cooper, who was the master of ceremonies because he is now the chairman of the uh, uh, American Russian Chamber of Commerce. So again, deep series of connections here. All right, so, um, and now you can get a sense of why some people thought this was all, all these uh, government sponsored power plant ideas was, was not about the people, it was about communism. Um, and uh, that caused the established private electric power industry, uh, they viewed it as an existential threat. Um, and so they fought it, that concept, every way they could, uh, including going to the Supreme Court. Uh, multiple cases went to the Supreme Court. Uh, eventually, all of them were won by the uh, Roosevelt administration, uh, thereby clearing the way for the construction of the great dams and Quadi. Um, and here are just two pieces of artwork that I, I personally love. Um, on the left is a cartoon of the... Um, uh, the Wilson Dam, Muscle Shoals, and the Power Trusts, uh, Fat Cats, crying themselves a river because they've lost it to the control of the dam to the, to the government. Um, and on the right, a very Soviet-looking poster for the Tennessee Valley Authority, Electricity for All. Yes. Uh, so, um, so that's the what's going on. So uh, these court cases eventually clear the legal hurdles for Quadi. But Quadi has been hotly debated in the press. It's been attacked uh, tremendously by the, the uh, interests of the power companies. Uh, there have been all kinds of public debate, private debate, uh, government studies, private secret reports, top secret reports. Um, and the depression is still going on. Maine. Uh, the country has got 30% unemployment at, the, at this time, and Maine, Eastern Maine, has 60% unemployment. So something's got to be done. And finally, Franklin says, enough, Maine is in desperate need, let's build Quadi. And so in 1935, in the spring of 1935, he, using the executive authority already granted to him as part of the New Deal, um, authorizes construction of an all-American plan version of Quadi. Basically, it's the same idea, but instead of including Canada, which is still problematic, they're going to build the whole thing in, within Maine, within Cobbs Cove Bay. Um, and so it would be smaller. It would be a $35 million project instead of a $100 million project. I had about 35 square miles, but it would also have two poles, a high pool and a low pool, so you could generate power continuously. Um, and again, it would be part of the public power initiative government-sponsored regional economic development for hydropower. And the whole point was employ people. That's why Quadi was approved. It was because it was going to generate 5,000 jobs for five years, desperately needed jobs right now. Now, this is in the spring, and he wanted it to be underway by July 4th, three months later. So huge amount of work has to get going. Uh, planning all of this thing from his decision to live construction in three months. They do it. The Army Corps of Engineers is put in charge because that's who the government hires to do big construction projects like this. And they decide to have um, uh, the kickoff for the construction be on July 4th because uh, Eastport has always had uh, a great big party on July 4th. And so this would be great. Instead of fireworks, they use dynamite. And they blow up a whole big pile of dirt and start construction and have a big party all at once. And so they do. Everybody's there, thousands of people. It's a great time. And this gentleman here is not Dexter Cooper, the designer of the project, is Major Philip Fleming of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He has to show the first throw, show, throw the first shovel of dirt. And Dexter isn't even invited. In fact, they throw out all of his plants. They start from scratch. So uh, backing up here a sec. 
um, if this project is going to employ 5,000 people for five years, one of the first things you're going to have to deal with is that uh, you have to put them somewhere. And Eastport is a little city. It's 3,500 people. So where are you going to put 5,000 people? Um, and the answer is that you can't fit them all there. And so you have to build a city. And you have to build it in six months flat. And they do. The Army Corps of Engineers designs and builds a city called Quadi Village in six months flat. And this is a, a aerial photograph of the central part of Quadi Village. And it's got, you can see over here, single family homes, duplexes, uh, four quads, apartment buildings, uh, wood shops, laundries, garages, movie theaters, everything uh, that you need in a city. Um, because they've got 5,000 people. They have to hire and build and house in six months flat. They do it. It's incredible. And the centerpiece of the whole thing is this administration building. Huge, 245 feet long. It holds 480 desks. That is 10 times as many staff as the Cooper brothers use on their projects. Professional staff, engineers. Uh, it also... Is very fancy. It has gold-plated mailboxes. Now, the fanciness of this uh, raises a lot of eyebrows. And in fact, almost immediately, Kauai Village becomes known as a boondoggle. And a boondoggle is a really interesting uh, history. The first use of it, we think, is invented to describe Daniel Boone, the, who uh, the American uh, uh, frontier explorer who used to tie his gear onto his clothes so his hands were free to do whatever, particularly crossing rivers. That idea of tying things onto your clothes morphs and becomes decorative knot tying for things like bow ties uh, that the uh, Boy Scouts make called neckerchief slides. Um, and then uh, at this time, 1936, uh, the very conservative uh, Republican dominated uh, Boston Herald uh, newspaper runs an editorial complaining about the New Deal. And the New Deal, uh, along with building these big infrastructure things, also hired artists and artisans to do what they do including people who tied knots to build hammocks. Therefore, they were uh, doing boondoggling, tying decorative knots. Um, and so that they coined the phrase of a boondoggle, meaning a useless government expense, in their view, of hiring arts and artisans to do what they do. Um, and so boondoggle is now directly first used in this modern sense of wasteful government spending as attacking Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And Quadi, because it was part of the New Deal and for many crazy idea still uh, to use the tides, the lunatic idea, uh, it was a boondoggle. So Quadi becomes the prototypical boondoggle. So, and also the other thing was that um, gold-plated mailboxes and huge buildings with 10 times as many uh, uh, professional staff and a fleet of uh, chauffeur-driven cars, uh, it seemed like the army was deliberately spending money as fast as they could. And so uh, Quadi was in trouble in the press and in, and in political halls of power because our industry was against it, and it was not going good in terms of financial controls up in Maine. So, um, but they did, in fact, on Christmas Day, 1936, six months in, they had 5,124 people employed. They built that thing six months flat. Uh, and in January, they did actually start building the dams uh, to build the, the power 
Um, and unlike uh, most of the Cooper Brothers' other dams, which were concrete, this was going to be what they called earth fill dams. And these are basically just big causeways, just like any other railroad or road construction project. You, you, you uh, dynamite a hill, you get a whole lot of rock, you put it in dump trucks or train trucks, uh, and you dump it, and then you keep dumping and dumping and dumping and dumping, and you work your way from mainland to island to island to island, and eventually you enclose the bay. And so that's what's going on here. Uh, in the background here is uh, Perry Point, the mainland. And this is the first dam. This is one of the smallest sections going to Carlo Island, and then they're, they we are working their way off onto um, uh, going to Eastport. Uh, and so they're they're building all this stuff. They're making progress. Uh, they've built this incredible city, uh, which, by the way, is such an interesting project. It's moving so fast, and the whole quality project is so interesting that a quarter of a million people drive all the way to Eastport, Maine, to see this thing. So quarter million people go to Eastport, population 3,500. All right, so uh, despite all this progress, uh, Quadi is ridiculed in the press. Uh, it's a national story. It's just almost all of the press, and I looked at thousands of articles, are negative um, because uh, the press is largely controlled by the power companies. Um, and here's just a sampling of cartoons from around the country. There's the um, Buffalo, New York, uh, New York, New York, uh, even Duluth, Minnesota. Um, there are editorials and, and, and plenty of poetry about Quadi. It even appeared in the Los Angeles Times. It was all over the place. Well, despite all of this, um, Dexter Cooper was still involved. Uh, he wasn't allowed to do any engineering. He wasn't allowed to manage the construction. Um, he was told to go find someone to buy this power because we're going to look like fools if we don't have anybody who to buy the power. And the power companies say there's no one around who will buy this power. No matter what price you do, it's not needed. Um, and so Dexter had five years to find somebody to do that. Um, and so he's off doing that. And, and he's also continued to talk about the need for this power plant because one of the things he's always said is that you need diverse sources of power. You can't rely on any one thing and tidal power because it's different and because it's predictable is a really good uh, alternative source of power. And Maine was too dependent on one source of power. In fact, 93% of the power in Maine came from rivers. And the problem with rivers but as you know, they have droughts and they also flood. And almost all of them flooded in 1936, knocking out almost all of the power plants. And here's one of them under about 30 feet of water. Um, and so this, uh, in entrepreneurial world, we call this a proof point. It's like, see, I told you this was gonna happen. Here it is, one of the protection key points of you need other sources of power. This isn't going to happen on the tide power plant. The second pr proof point came up pretty quickly. Remember, I just said Dexter was off trying to find a market. Well, guess what? In just nine months, he finds companies who will buy all of the power that the Quadi Tato Power Project can produce and more if it were available. The problem is that. It's only when the dam is done, which is five years away. And in the meantime, nobody has been authorized, not him or anybody else, to sign a contract. So how do you manifest this? And uh, so that's a problem. But there's another really good thing here. There's a third proof point, which is those companies that Dexter has are going to employ 3,000 people permanently, not just for the construction of the dam, but permanently. These are manufacturing jobs that are going to be created in the area. So this is a huge news. This is the proof of the whole concept of government-sponsored regional economic development based on hydropower. This is proof of Franklin Roosevelt's public power initiatives. But, but, Dexter wouldn't disclose the names of the companies. Because if he did, 
he would be disclosing their competitive plans. And if he did, he would be disclosing his competitive advantage against the private power companies. So he's in a, he's in a tight spot. He's got people ready to buy the power, but he can't say who they are. And therefore, he is instantly branded a liar. Now, what are you going to do? Well, time marches on, and Franklin Roosevelt is being challenged. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, public power initiatives are being challenged, most spectacularly by this gentleman. Arthur Vandenberg, Senator from Michigan. He is a really smart, really funny guy. And he attacks the New Deal and he uses Quaddy, that boomed up Quaddy, that crazy idea way the hell up in Maine as his method of attack because he wants to be president. And it is he who invents the term moondog because Quaddy is clearly an enormous boondoggle. And it's a lunatic, moony idea. It's a moondoggle. And that is the origin of the term moondoggle. It is not, as many people believe, and as some magazines have repeatedly said, uh, it doesn't originate in uh, the, the space program in the 1960s. It's invented by Arthur Vandenberg in May 1936. So, there's a curious thing here. Arthur Vandenberg, the leading Republican contender at this time for the presidency, the chief critic of uh, the Quadi Title Power Project, sits in the Senate right next to Maine's Senator Frederick Hale. Now you can imagine that there's a lot of pressure being put on Senator Hale who's got this huge Democratic New Deal project in his state, and the Republicans are against the New Deal entirely, and specifically, Senator Vandenberg is against Quaddy. Quaddy is in trouble. And uh, Maine's Democratic governor, Louis Brand, realizes how important Quaddy is to his state. There are 5,000 direct people being employed in his state that would otherwise be unemployed because of the Quaddy project. And he needs it to continue because Quaddy was being funded on annual installments, not up a whole front up front. So he needs the next installment. So he does something unusual. He uh, calls up to get rid of some of the politics. He uh, tries to put together a deal that has Quaddy evaluated on merits, not the politics, just the merits. And one of the ways he does that is he calls up Florida, the governor of Florida, who also has a very controversial big government project called the Florida Ship Canal, which is uh, similar in many respects, different in others, but uh, two big New Deal controversial projects. And he says, let's get rid of at least the uh, regional conflicts here by putting both of our projects into the same bucket and have them treated the same way, have them evaluated on the technical financial merits by the same set of engineers. And regardless of what they say, thumbs up on one, thumbs up on the other, thumbs up on both, thumbs down on both, whatever they say, that's what we'll do. And so Florida agrees. He gets a whole batch of senators to agree. This thing looks like it's going to pass. Uh, it's ready for a vote in the Senate. And at the last minute, Frederick Hale changes the deal. He wants Quaddy split from Florida, and he wants Quaddy voted on first. Pretty quickly, everybody realizes the double cross. He wants to vote his own project in and then vote this one out. And so all the people at Pran who've gotten together to vote for this independent evaluation of quality, vote against it, and quality is good. Even the senator from Nebraska, Senator Norris, who's the father of the TBA, the father of the whole projects, he votes against it because he sees the rat. So 
who killed Clyde this time? Was it Senator Hale, who was doing dirty Maine politics? Was it Vandenberg, the very clever, very insightful, very funny uh, uh, senator who wants to be president? Was the whole thing being run by the power companies? Or was the army engineers doing something? Because they sure seemed to be spending money as fast as they possibly could. They were running double the budget and they hadn't even been at it for a year. Or was it somebody else? Frankly, it didn't matter because Franklin Roosevelt still had the executive authority to do the project. He still had the money to do the project. The question was, would he? Because clearly at this point, it was an enormous political headache. And Franklin Roosevelt was headed to Camp Bell. And Franklin Roosevelt, from his porch on Camp Bell, can see construction of the project. So he's headed to Camp Bell. Um, and he's not sure he wants to go into Eastport because there are a lot of angry people in Eastport at the moment. Um, but he does. Uh, and he tours the whole place. He goes all through Quadi Village. And he goes to one of the buildings they built um, in Quadi Village called the Exhibit Hall which there are so many people coming to Eastport to see this thing that they had to have a place where they put all these exhibits. Um, and that was the exhibit hall. Uh, and so, and the centerpiece of the exhibit hall, they had just, just finished the week before, is what you see in front of you. And this is called the working model of the quality title power project. It's 12 feet by 16 feet. It weighs eight tons, it's made of concrete and steel. It's what the Army Corps of Engineers makes stuff of. It's concrete and steel. It is a scale model of the whole quality tower project, and it works. The tides go up and down. They flow in and out through the gates. Uh, the gates open and close, and the lights go on and off. Um, and it was incredibly powerful and effective way of showing the hundreds of thousands of people who came what the quality tower project was and how it worked. And so Frank and Roosevelt, after he tours all around town, uh, Quadi Village, comes to the, to the um, exhibit place and uh, uh, looks at it and, and walks in, spends 20 minutes, um, and uh, is uh, really intrigued by it and then walks out. So if he walks both directions, this is really important. When he leaves, he says, when I get back next year, I hope it'll be an operation. Now, clearly that's not a commitment, that's a hope, but he does get onto the presidential yacht goes across the bay, gets onto a train, goes to Ottawa to meet with Premier Ken. So that's what's happening privately, but the public story is very different. The public story is best exhibit here, which is the March of Time, was groundbreaking doc photojournalism movies, documentaries, newsreels. And they did an eight minute piece on the Quality Title Power Project. It debuted at 10,000 theaters around the English speaking world, which means millions of people saw it. Um, and the question really is, is it journalism or propaganda? And I can tell you, I've studied every frame, every word, every musical note, uh, and I have an opinion, and there's a clue. that I used boondoggle five times. So um, that's the public face. The reality is that 5,124 people were thrown out of work immediately. This is a very famous photograph. It's of uh, unemployed workers in Eastport. Um, and if you go to Google right now and you type in unemployment, Great Depression, this photograph will probably come up pretty quickly. Uh, very famous. Uh, it was not just the 5,124 direct employees. It also brought down all kinds of businesses throughout uh, Eastport and Eastern Maine. They went bankrupt because they had no more customers. Um, and it wasn't just the businesses in Eastport that went bankrupt, it was Eastport that went bankrupt. They did not get a single dollar out of the quality title power project, despite the enormous extra expenses and hassles that they experienced. Um, so it was a bad time. Um, and in fact, it was a bad time. Uh, Dexter Cooper uh, died, his doctor said, of a broken heart. Uh, he couldn't, he had suffered so much and it was dead. Bad time for everybody. 
Uh, World War II begins in Poland. Uh, that means, and England honored their commitments to Poland, which means that England was in the war, which means that Canada was in the war. So Kwadi, again, is now off the table as a possibility, even though it could have helped um, because Kwadi is exposed on the coastline. Um, and that is a really important point. When the war starts, Franklin, we had about 200, the United States had about 200 combat airplanes total, 200. Franklin Roosevelt estimated that we need about 50,000 per year to win the war. And if you're going to produce that many airplanes, you need an enormous amount of aluminum. And to produce that much aluminum, you need an enormous amount of electric power. And unfortunately, Roosevelt was proven right and most spectacularly and, and terrifyingly by the Nazi invasion of Russia. When they invaded uh, the Soviet Union, they came in with 2,700 planes in a single formation, uh, the world's largest invasion, and they were headed for the Cooper Brothers Dam on the Niper River because that dam was what powered the nitrate plants and the aluminum plants. And instead of uh, having the Nazis get a hold of that, Joseph Stalin himself ordered the destruction of the Night Dam by blowing up thousands of pounds of dynamite that had been built into the dam uh, from the beginning. And, uh, and so the Germans eventually did get it, uh, but it wasn't working. They rebuilt it because it was so important. To them. This is what they were after. So public power, Roosevelt's public power initiatives did in fact get going, the great Western names. They were the power for the arsenal of democracy. And if you look at um, the, the net increase in the United States amount of power production, it's almost all the uh, public power initiatives, Roosevelt's uh, great Western dams. And it was out of that water power comes air power and it's air power that won. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, Franklin didn't live long enough to see the, the to win, see the war being won. He died just a few weeks too soon. Um, and that ends uh, our story of Franklin Roosevelt and the Quality Tactical Power Project, or at least chapter three. Uh, but the story does not end. Quality is, as they say, the dream that wouldn't die. And it actually continues through three more presidents. But if you want to know about that, you'll have to get the book. So uh, I hope uh, you found that it's interesting. And I'd be delighted to hear your stories or, or take your questions.